I'm going to talk about uh, cardio and estimates. So I think that people, many of you have heard the name before, if not, certainly during these things. So many of you have wondered, you know, what are these magical cardio and estimates? They seem to be the answer to every question in the world. <laughs> and I'm sorry to disappoint you, that's far from true. <laughs> um, my goal is to tell you what a cardio and estimate. What, what is a carbon estimate? What was it used for? And uh, where has it showed up in inverse problems? Okay. So I'm uh, maybe I'll give you one proof uh, because it's simple. The rest is mainly you know trying to help you understand what is a carbon estimate. And uh, if I if I have time, I'll show you it's what use an inverse problem. I know two places it's been used in inverse problems. One I know very well, and the other one I know almost nothing about. Okay? So, uh, but I'll explain to you both where those two places are. Other than that, it's not being used in inverse problems. Okay. All right, so, other thing I want to emphasize, I really want to make clear, I'm not an expert on inverse problems. Uh, sorry, on the uh, Kahneman <laughs> 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 yeah. I, so if there is an expert here on Kahneman estimates, please, okay, be bear with me. I'm not an expert on Kahneman estimates. Um, see, the first time I saw Kahneman estimates was, uh, I work on hyperbolic inverse problems. There is a very famous result for hyperbolic inverse problems due to Bogiev and Klebanov in 1981. I was still a graduate student then, okay? And uh, it's a very special result of that kind, and there is still only that result of that kind. Uh, if I have time, I'll tell you. So I was still impressed by that as a graduate student, and it was done with Kahneman estimates. That was the first time <coughs> Kahneman estimates were used in inverse problems. So I started sort of studying Kahneman estimates a little bit then, but over the last three, four years, I started studying it more carefully, uh, just based on Kahneman estimates, because I thought I could use it for another hyperbolic inverse problem. I haven't succeeded yet, okay, but that's my goal. So I just started studying it, you know, four or five years, a little more carefully, understanding the proof and maybe some other things. And that's what I'm really going to tell you about, okay? So what I understood, okay. So what are Kahneman estimates and what were they used for in the beginning? So Hermander developed uh, Kahneman estimates Professor Jan Goben was very much there, 1960s, right? <laughs> yes. So, Professor Goben as it is for Manda student. So, <laughs> okay. So, it, before I get into Kahneman estimates, let's see what is the issue here. Okay. So, if you are looking at some domain, if you're looking at some domain, uh, D in, uh, let's call it omega, and let's say you want to look at the standard well post problem, I'm going to keep it here at zero, then typically you would prescribe u equals f on the line, right? This is a typical well post problem, okay? Uh, and you know, there is existence, uniqueness, stability, whatever you want to know. But typically what happens is, say, if you're trying to do one of these inverse problems, or even actually just forward problems, you do not have information about the solution on all parts of the bound. Right? So let's say you could only measure information only on this part of the boundary, let's call it gamma. So, you know, Laplacian U is zero in the region. U is F, not on this, but on gamma. Okay? This is very little information. You cannot, I mean, there are many solutions of this problem then. Okay? <laughs> but since you can measure here, so not only can you get U, you can also get the normal. Suppose you also, someone gives you the normal derivative. And then you ask, you know, well, what about this problem? Okay, so this is called the Cauchy problem, right? Because you're prescribing Cauchy data is meaning that you have a surface and you prescribe all the, the values of the function, all the possible derivatives you can prescribe up to one less than the order. Because then if it's a non-characteristic surface, all the other derivatives can be obtained from these, right? So second order, if it's non-characteristic, it's non-characteristic, you have the first and the normal, all of the derivatives can be obtained. So then you ask, well, what about this problem? Does it have a 
solution. And for this problem, yes, but we are not interested in just constant coefficients. You might be interested in, and this might be any other elliptic operator. Okay, just let's say it's this one. Okay, so then you say, well, yeah, okay, there is some result like this, which is uh, there is a Cauchy Kobalaskaya theorem. Right? Cauchy Kobalaskaya says if Q was an unfit, then you prescribe Cauchy data, you can actually solve it. Right? But as we've been seeing in those problems, you rarely get Q which is analytic. These are smooth functions now. Right? Cauchy Kobalaskaya is not applicable. Okay? And so then you question what about the question of existence? And the answer is that in general, you cannot prescribe F and G arbitrarily. If you want to prescribe Cauchy data on this, you cannot prescribe F and G arbitrarily in general. Okay? There are sometimes relationships and so on. So existence is gone. Forget existence. You will not be able to get general existence for this. Okay, for general F and G. There are examples and all that which show you cannot do it. But okay, uh, this is coming from a real problem. So I know there is a solution to this problem. I I measured it. It's coming from a real problem. So then the next question you ask is, okay, given this F and G, I know there is a solution. Is that the only solution? So that is the question we are trying to answer here. I have a domain omega, say an elliptic problem. You prescribe, instead of a whole boundary, you prescribe U on the boundary. But to compensate for this, you also prescribe the normal, uh, the normal derivative. And then you ask, if it has a solution, is it unique? Okay, so this is uniqueness in the Cauchy problem. Okay, so uniqueness question is basically you're asking if this is zero here, is it zero inside? That's really what you're asking. Okay, because that's uniqueness. Okay. Um, but this is the elliptic case. Let me give you an example of a hyperbolic problem. Okay? Typical hyperbolic initial boundary value problem. You have a domain <coughs> omega. So this is space and time. Okay, this is space, this is time. Think of it like a disk or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay? And this is the space time cylinder. All right, so this is omega cross C. So, typical hyperbolic problem. Let's say the wave equation. <coughs> and let's put a Q there. I mean, it doesn't have to have that off constant principle order. I mean, you can put anything you like okay. in, in this whole domain here. So what's a well posed problem for a hyperbolic thing? You prescribe initial conditions at time t equal to zero. So u is f, u t is g on omega cross t equal to zero. And then you prescribe one boundary condition. Let's prescribe the Dirichlet boundary condition on Right. That's a typical well posed initial boundary value problem, hyperbolic equation, assuming matching conditions and all that stuff. You know, it has a unique solution. Solution depends continuously and all that stuff. Okay. Now, so remember what this is. This is this is my domain omega, and this is time. Right. You're doing one of these inverse problems. Where are your measurements coming? Your measurements are coming on the boundary, which means on the time-like cylinder. So suppose, for whatever reason, okay, we'll see there are examples where some of the other I lose information about the initial condition. <coughs> suppose I lose information, whatever, for whatever reason, okay. So my problem is just this, and u equals h. This doesn't have a unique solution. It, it, you can construct many solutions, but to, fa the fact is that since it's on the boundary, I can make measurements there in my whatever I'm doing. So suppose, as before, now I also know. 
the normal derivative on the time axis. So I lost my initial data, but I gained normal derivatives also on the boundary. Okay? Then the first question you ask is existence. Does this problem, you just described Cauchy data on this lateral boundary, does it have a solution? Okay? And the answer is no. In general, you can show that for a general H1, H2, this problem need not even have a solution. Because for solutions of the wave equation, there are various various ways of showing this, there is sometimes even a relationship between these things. Okay? So you cannot describe arbitrary value for H1 and H2 for Cauchy data on the lateral boundary. No, you cannot. Okay? Only for certain H1 and H2 will this have a solution. So okay, existence is gone, that's okay. It came from a real problem, there is a solution. Question is, is the solution unique? Okay? So if you prescribe these, suppose there is a solution. Is there only one solution or more? Or equivalently, if it is zero on the lateral boundary, is the solution zero inside? And it may be not on the whole boundary, you know, maybe it is only on a piece of the boundary, only on this much. So it may be just on a piece of this. Okay? So the question is, what's, what's the answer for this? Okay, in both of these cases, I, let me also tell you the answer. I mean, here are a lot of experts on analytic problems, they all know the answer to this. Again, in the analytic case, it's, perhaps it's worth putting up, if, again, if the Q is analytic, it follows from no. it. Is, is, is analytic. Right, correct, right. Yeah. If it's Q is analytic, again, it's Cauchy, Kobola, Stengel, like to give existence, and if Q is analytic, actually, Holmgren's theorem, even if this surface was not smooth, would give unique continuation. Yeah. Holmgren's theorem says, yeah? Sorry. Uh, if we go to the spectral domain, since it's localized, whatever we have data is localized in space and time. But if we go to the frequency domain, it may spread out. So we can continue. All right. Okay. Let's discuss this later if you don't mind. All right? Sorry, you were saying something? My point, but I just make sure I'm understanding your little curved strip should not be going all the way down to the bottom, should it? Yeah, correct. So it's uh, like region is. But not all the way to the bottom, I thought, because you, you dropped the initial condition. Right, so I don't have anything here, and this is all on the edge. This is all the vertical cylinder. Yeah, going all the way to t equals to zero, actually. Right, so, but, but I don't have information in here. Right, T equal to zero is the horizontal horizontal region then. Right. Okay. So right, very much so, correct. The first thing is if Q is analytic, then existence is captured by Cauchy Kobola style. Sorry, I made one mistake. Cauchy Kobola style is only applicable if this is an analytic surface. If it's not an analytic surface, you don't have Cauchy Kobola style for existence. But you still have uniqueness because of Holmgren's theorem, if this is an analytic. This is the same trinity as long as the coefficients are analytic. But our situation is, I'm going to assume my coefficients are C infinity, let's say, and my surface is some C infinity function. Okay, you're right, sorry, I just, that needs to be corrected. What's the result in the elliptic case? There are various ways of doing it, but uh, the answer is that if U is, U and term to near zero, then it's actually zero here, everywhere. Okay, there's unique continuation for any elliptic problem. The question is, how would you prove this? For second order. Right? So only for a second order. Oh, right, okay, I, I don't know. My, okay, this is one of very important. Right, 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 very important caveat. My knowledge of Kahneman estimates and everything is limited to second order <laughs> equations. <laughs> I'm going to tell you only for second order. Right, everything I say is for second order. Unity of continuation is true for second order elliptic, but you can have nice first order elliptic equation with a way this compactly supported solution. All right, okay. So it's only second so order. Okay, <laughs> so I, I only know the second order theory. Kahneman estimates are actually there for higher order operators also, but I don't know that theory that well. So everything I'm going to say is for second order. Right, okay, so in this case, it's, what about in this case, for the hyperbolic case? Uh, the answer is that the solution is zero. So 
So the solution is zero on a subset of this domain, which can be described in terms of times and so on. Okay, um, let's see if I can write down the exact uh, description. I wrote it carefully. Okay, I didn't write it. It's taking a few minutes to reconstruct it. I, I'll skip that. But it's basically, basically related to travel time and how fast things travel and stuff. And uh, I want to say it's zero on, basically it's like this. If you have a flat thing, then, uh, let's see, how do you say this? Uh, right, you sort of uh, go in like this. This much, like it's sort of like this. You go in, you go like this much. So if you know up till here, you can go this far and recover. Roughly, that's the argument for the hyperbolic. So this is vertical, and that's what you can do for the hyperbolic case. So you cannot get to the whole domain um, unless your time is big enough. See, then you do this, so then it overlaps. So in particular, you can recover everything up to here also. And the moment you have initial data now and one boundary data, you get everything. Is it a region that you can fill by non-characteristic surfaces? Uh, is that the region? No, right, actually, so Pythagoras theorem now says that you can fill it up by non-characteristic surfaces, exactly. Right, exactly that. <clears throat> so if you have a hyperbolic thing, if it's very short, and basically it's a region like this that you can recover. And if it's very long, then because of the overlap, you then get initial data, and then because of initial data, you can go all the way up and down, fill the whole thing. Okay, so that's your hyperbolic story. Okay, so question is, how does this result prove? Uh, first, I don't know how it was, probably it was, was for Mandas, there are many proofs for this result. Uh, I don't know if it was first time that was with Kahneman estimates or with some other way. So I think Almagren proved first. Who sorry? Almagren. Almagren proved first. And what method did he use for that? Not uh, not Kahneman estimate. Not so some other method. Some other. Okay. Which year was that? You know. 50, 58, around between fifties. Okay. Now so whatever I mean this is okay. Well, by the way, what is my point? Knowledge on Kahneman estimates based on. Two things, two actually two sources that I've used. One is there's this wonderful book by Hormander, right? The book from the 1960s. Uh, there's a whole chapter on Kahneman estimates where the whole thing is developed very well. That's one source. The second source is uh, Tataru. Some of you probably heard the name Daniel Tataru. Uh, he's done things which take you beyond Kahneman. He and you know Nicholas Lerner, Robiano, and various other people have done things which go beyond Kahneman estimates, which is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so he's written some set of notes, but it's very casual, not complete. It's on his web page. So I've used that as a guide also. Okay, those are my two main sources for whatever I'm telling you today. Okay, so this is the standard. So this is the question that one is interested in. This is the general question I'm going to try to talk about. Okay, so I will have a second order operator, which will be, I'm just writing it. Okay, plus a C. Okay, and then the condition is that AJKX are real now. And as soon as I want, now DJ, um, I could use delta J, but DJ is because of this symbol thing. It really stands for this. Okay, the one over right there, because of the way the symbol is defined, those of you who are experts know all of this. So I'm not. Okay, so this is going to be my the standard operator. I'm not assuming it's elliptic or anything. This includes the wave operator, for example. Right? Wave operator, this will be the AJK matrix collapse signature minus one, and then the rest all plus ones. Okay? But it also includes operators of other kinds, like uh, alpha hyperbolic operators. You could have things like operators like this, right? Kahneman estimates actually, I mean, they, 
become interesting, according to me, when the operator is not elliptic. The elliptic stand is, uh, for Karman uh, stand, is fairly simple. Like the consequences. It's the interesting things happen when the operator is not elliptic, when there are arrays and characteristics, and then that interesting things happen. All right, so I guess so this is the situation I'm going to be, and let's see. So the typical question I'm going to have is, you have a region omega, okay, and you're looking at q equal to zero in omega. And I'll have a part of the boundary, gamma, and the question is, if Is you, so I, u is zero, u n is zero. Yeah. Is u zero inside? Okay. This is the so-called uniqueness in the Cauchy problem. People do a different. By the way, this is this, this also includes the hyperbolic case I talked about. Because what is your domain there? Your domain is this whole thing cylinder, and I have data only on this part. I don't have data on this part of the boundary. This is part of the boundary, by the way. I don't have data there. I only have data on a part of the boundary. Okay, so a hyperbolic situation also fits into this. You can think of this as being a situation. Okay, so people study this. They don't study it in this fashion. What you, I mean, this is in a very informal way. So this is always going to be non-characteristic. It's a non-characteristic surface. So if you know u and un, and q is known there, you can recover all the derivatives of q on that. And once you recover all the derivatives, let's say you can make a u, sort of a smooth continuation of the zero function. If the two derivatives, are, these two derivatives are zero, q is zero, all the derivatives are zero there. Right, because it's non-characteristic, you can compute all of them. So you can think of this as basically making u equal to zero here. And you will, because it's a smooth continuation, you will still satisfy on this in the bigger set, actually. Okay? So the way the people think of the problem is, they will say, this is really the way they think about this problem. They will say, I have some domain omega, some re redefining omega. PU is zero in this whole domain. I have some surface here, gamma u equal to 0 on this side of the surface, near this point, say. Is u equal to 0 on the other side, the so-called unique continuation R question. So u is 0 on one side of a hypersurface. Can you continue to u equal to 0 on the other side? Where p u equal to 0 on the whole domain. Right? This is how, so this is the uniqueness in the Cauchy problem, or I'll call it unique continuation problem. All right. Okay, now seeing him, I'm reminded of, I should be saying this one thing also. Elliptic equations have even a stronger property, a strong unique continuation property. Again, I don't, I, I think this is only true for second order, then I guess. Yeah. Which says that, you know, if you have, say, Laplace in u equal to zero, and you're at this point, suppose the function, and you can put, Suppose the function and all its derivatives are zero, not on some surface or not on one side, but just at one point. Okay? Then for elliptic solution of elliptic thing, that the solution is zero on the whole thing. Right? It's the strong unique continuation property. Okay? So that is not covered by this kind of Kahneman estimate. For that, one of the ways of proving those things are, is by Kahneman estimates with singular weights. Okay, and that is not in the Theory covered in the Formandas book in the 1960s. Okay, that's a separate issue. I don't know anything about that. Is that okay? I'm being a little sporadic and going back and forth, but my idea is to communicate what is the kind of problem it's going to try to solve. So this is the problem we're going to work on. E is a second order operator, principal part is real. Some domain omega, there is some surface, okay, gamma, and u equal to zero on one side of it. 
near at some point, this is all a local thing we are talking about. Is u equal to zero on the other side? Is u equal to zero in a neighborhood of that point? That's the question I would say. And this is what Cardiwan estimates help you answer. Okay. So what is a Cardiwan estimate? Let me state it. So this is what a Cardiwan estimate looks like. I'm going to state it in a form. Uh, which is not in Hermann's book, but it's inherent there, and later people write it because it's useful in this form for many things. Okay. The way the Kahneman state is stated in Hermann's book is without any boundary terms, uh, because he assumes uh, functions of compact support inside, and that's adequate for unique <coughs> continuation. But with the boundary term, it's more useful for many things for hyperbolic problems. So that's why I'm going to state later. So this is what a Kahneman is. Okay, so it states the following. Okay, here's the theorem. Okay, let's see. Here. So everything is smooth, by the way, okay? I mean, it's actually true for C1 or C1 and a half or something, but I'll just do it for smooth. So suppose omega is a bounded domain. in R then, and phi, I'm going to use a term which I'll talk about later, phi of x, phi is a pseudo convex, sorry, phi x, phi is this, I'm going to not write the whole thing, okay? remember very important, Second order, real. This is important here. Okay, <coughs> PHC is the form. If C is pseudo convex with respect to PHC, so pseudo convexity is a condition tied to the operator. Okay, so if is pseudo, uh, pseudo convex with respect to PHC, then the following Cardinal estimate holds. So this is what a Cardinal estimate is. And this is the boundary term. Second, for all you belonging to, okay. all right, there's a constant. For all sigma, where C and sigma zero. They are independent of you. I mean, this constant doesn't depend on you. And this, you know, this whole thing is true for sigma greater than some this thing. This thing is also independent of you. And QX. Okay, this is this is some boundary term. You can write out explicitly what it is. And this is important in some situations. Okay, this is explicit. I mean, it's not some arbitrary. You can write it down completely in terms of the operator, phi, and so on. And Q stands for it's a quadratic form. It's going to be a quadratic form in this vector, which is red into Q and sigma into Q. Which means that it will have terms like delta I, U, delta J, U. And then it might have terms like sigma u, delta i u, or it might have terms like sigma squared u squared. It says quadratic form in this 
not second order derivatives, but squares of first order derivatives. Okay? Most of the time it will not play any role for what I'm going to do today, but this is actually very useful for certain situations where you want to know what's happening on the Hal gradient controller. Okay, and you'll see that for inverse problem, that's something you want to do. Okay? But for unique continuation, this is not really relevant. The way the whole bandha was said was instead of saying for all C infinity omega bar, he had C0 infinity omega bar. So the boundary terms are gone. And that's good enough for unique continuation. Okay? But if you go through his proof, actually this part is there inherent in this. So it's useful for that. So this is kind of an estimate. Let, let's just look at it, different pieces for it for a second. Right? So here is my operator, PU. Right? So and forget about the boundary term, just okay. So PU. And it's from that, it's a second order operator. I'm estimating the gradient, the gradient of U squared. It's not quite like an elliptic operator. If it was an elliptic operator, this would be like second order things here. Right? But it's only going up to first order. But it's surprisingly able to do it. Okay? This is surprising, right, in general, that uh, even for a hyperbolic operator to be able to get something <laughs> like this. Right? Hyperbolic operators are not like elliptic operators. Right? You have the wave equation here, and you are estimating the first order and the that's sort of surprising, right? But there is a price to pay for it, right? In general, it's not true, but it comes with a weight. It's the weight which is allowing you to do this, okay? And not for any arbitrary function, though. It's a function which is pseudo-convex with respect to the operator. Now, what is pseudo-convex? We will talk about this, okay? So, but I want to sort of emphasize this certain features of it. So this is surprising, right? Even for a wave operator kind of thing, you're able to say this. Right? We are used to saying things like this for elliptic operators, but for wave operators, but of course it's not like it's not like a standard L2 estimate. Right? I mean that would not be true. Okay? It comes with a weight and there is a price to pay for the weight. Okay. Um, other thing is notice the sigma. This, this is really so crucial for Carnegie estimates. That this estimate is uniform in sigma. The way Carnegie estimates, as I'm going to show you, is, is sigma is always going to be let go to, is sigma goes to infinity. That's what we're going to do. Many times we apply Carnegie estimates, we let sigma go to infinity. Okay? And then we'll balance things out and see which is what and so on. Okay? So, and here's the way, the way, the phi, the pseudo convex function phi. Right? Okay. So, first question is, how can you use this to prove, what does this want to do with unique continuation? I mean, you've got an estimate like this. How will you be able to show that if u is 0 on one side of the surface for certain things, then u is 0 on the other side? How is that going to help you? So firstly, what is the result that one can, one conclusion that one can draw from this? Okay, I, those of you who know how your estimate probably know this is wrong what I've said here. There's a minor correction which needs, okay? This estimate is not true for phi, but wherever there is a phi, you have to put an e to n to lambda phi. So it's really about everywhere, okay? So please, that's a correction there, but there is a reason why I'm leaving it like this, okay? I mean, it's, if phi is pseudo convex, then e to the power lambda phi satisfies something stronger, and the Kahneman estimates the truth for the stronger thing. That's how it really goes. Okay? So if phi is pseudo convex with respect to phi, then e to the power lambda phi for lambda large enough satisfies a slightly stronger condition, and the stronger condition implies Kahneman estimates. That's really how it goes. Okay? But I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to leave it like this. The important point is we are going to be working with the level surfaces of the function. And the level surfaces of phi and e to the power lambda phi are exactly the same. That's why whatever I'm going to do is not going to make a difference. I'm going to be looking at, here is phi equals some constant, and it's also the same as e to the power lambda phi equals some, it's also the level surface of the other one. So they have the same level surfaces, and the unique continuation and other things are really about level surfaces. Okay, so that's why that I made this mistake here. It's it's not really going to affect anything here. 
But I do want to let you know this is wrong the way I've stated it. All right. Uh, so what's the result? The result is that if P is pseudo convex with respect to PST, then you draw the level surface, any level surface of this, pick one, okay? And you pick a point here. Let's call it A. So now this level surface, so this is P equal, one side P will be greater than C and one side is less than C. So let's say the way I want to do it is, okay, I'm going to stick to one, one way of writing it, so let me do this way. So this is P equals PA. So let's say this is the side P greater than PA, and this is the side P less than PA. So from Carnival estimates, you can prove this. If U is zero here, and P U equal to zero, you know, in this region around it, implies u equal to zero in a neighborhood of this. So there is unique continuation across pseudo-convex surfaces from the greater than phi a side to the less, only one direction. This is important. You can only go from phi greater than phi a to phi less than phi a. You cannot go this way. So that's the consequence of this. So if you have a second order differential operator like that, you can find a pseudo -con. What is pseudo -con? I haven't yet talked about it at all. Okay, we'll, that's I'm going to spend a fair amount of time about it. So phi is pseudo convex for this operator. Draw the level surface, pick a point on it. Pick the greater than phi a and less than phi a side. If phi is zero in a neighborhood on one side, on the phi greater than phi a side, then phi is u is zero on the P less than PA side, if it satisfies the equation in that neighborhood. So that's the unique configuration result, and this is a direct consequence of this. Okay, question is, how do you, so, all right. So what is, so let's look at some special cases for this, right? So, so what kind of function are pseudo convex functions for certain operators? Let's think about this for a second. Okay, if you have an elliptic operator, again, second order, Every smooth function whose gradient is non zero at every point is pseudo convex for an elliptic operator. You take any function whose gradient, which means you know, it's a manifold at every point, the level terms, uh, it's, it's pseudo convex with respect to the elliptic operator. Which means for elliptic operator, there is unique continuation across any surface in any direction because you can choose phi and minus phi both. Okay, so that's the result I'm saying. For second order elliptic operators, there's unique continuation across any, and that's the end of the story for elliptic. So, I mean, that's what Carnot estimate tells you, and that's it. There's nothing very interesting or difficult or different. In the sense that it's true for everything. So the story starts becoming interesting when your operator P is not elliptic. So it's the wave equation, it's the ultra hyperbolic equation. Then the question is what kind of surfaces are pseudo convex surfaces for those kinds of operators? Elliptics, the theory is very, okay, very straightforward story, everything is pseudo convex. Okay, so the only proof I'm going to show you is how does this imply that? And there you will see the role of sigma going to infinity. Okay, so how does this estimate? Prove this result. Because this is also how it is used even in inverse problems. In this sort of, this same, same sort of idea.
okay, you always go one side, it's one sided. You cannot go, and when I, and especially, I mean, let's take it on an extent, for hyperbolic, when I tell you the pseudo convexity condition, you will see why it makes sense. Why it should not be two sided. All right, so here is the question. I'm going to assume my PU is zero in some big domain. It doesn't matter because this is a local result. I'm trying to prove it near each point. So here is my point A. I need to exaggerate this. This is not about convexity. This, the level curves don't have to be convex. It's easier to see the picture, but it's not about the level curves being convex or anything. Here is A. And I'm assuming my domain is big and PU is zero in that whole domain, okay? So remember, PU is zero in the whole thing, okay? And this is the P greater than PA part. And U is zero here, all right, on all of this. I want to show that U is actually zero in a neighborhood here, on the other side. Okay, and then I can do it at each point and so on. So, what you do is you define a new function and so this is pseudo convex, okay? So this estimate is true. Okay, so you define a new function which is like this. Okay? Now here is a, so I'm going to quote another result which is needed for this, which says that if P satisfies the Cartman estimate. If there's a Kahneman estimate with phi, then you change it a little bit up to second order derivatives. That new function also satisfies the Kahneman estimate. So actually, this estimate is true for psi. So for epsilon small enough, if epsilon is small enough, this, this psi will also satisfy the same Kahneman estimate because phi satisfies it. Right? There's a, so that's a, that's a little lemma actually, which if there is a cardinal estimate for something, then there is a cardinal estimate for a small perturbation of okay? it, second order perturbation, meaning second order derivatives have to be small. First, zero at first and second order derivatives are small. Pseudo convexity is the second order condition, like zero first. Okay, so now let me draw the level surfaces of psi. Okay, so let's look at psi equals psi of x equals, what does that look like? How does it compare to the level surfaces of P? Well, at A, they both agree, okay? But what about beyond that? Like, is psi x equal to psi A inside this or this side of this? Or it would cross both. I claim it's on this side. And I'll try to explain to you why. Okay, so psi of x equals psi a, psi of a is really phi of a, right? So phi of x is, so psi of x is phi of a, so phi of x minus, so you're looking for points like this. So you can see that phi of x is, So then that this level surface is really about the same, this equation, which means all the phi of x are greater than phi a, which means this level surface is on this side, right? Okay. So now let, let me draw a disk of radius delta, some disk of radius delta here. Okay, this is a disk of radius delta. Okay, all right. So now I'm going to, so this is my ball of radius delta. I'm going to apply my Cardinal estimate in this region. All right, so my omega is that region. Let's look at the, so what do I want to show? I want to show that if I could show u was zero in the whole thing, I'd be done, wonderful. So I really want to show this side is zero. 
I want to show that this side is, the, the right hand side is zero. If I show the right hand side is zero, this is zero and then I get my answer. It's not going to be as simple as that, but close. Okay, is the right hand side zero? Now this is the first term. What about PU? That's zero already, got. So it's the boundary terms, right? What part of the boundary is this not zero? Remember, u is zero on all this side. This is the only part of the boundary where u is not zero. Correct? u is zero. Okay. So I know my about this boundary terms give me something which is not zero, and I'm trying to prove u is zero on the not the whole thing, but at least here, right? But u is already zero here, so I just to worry about this. Okay. Now, so far I haven't used the weights. Now the sigma stands in the way. Forget the sigma. Okay, what is the weight here? Exponential to sigma psi. Remember, this does not depend on sigma. What is the value of psi here? On this part. So, well, this part is delta. Okay, and here, Px is less than Pa, right? So this is less than So let me just write this here. So on the part of the boundary where there is non-zero terms, I have psi is less than, or let's say equal. <coughs> On this part of the boundary where it's the data is not, I have one. Right? Okay. Now what about the value of psi here? Well, here it is exactly psi a, correct? So in some small neighborhood of this, I can guarantee that psi is actually greater than psi a right? It's exactly psi a here. It's a continuous function. So if you go a little bit away, you're not going to change it so much. So there is some neighborhood in which the weight here is satisfies, is greater than. It's smaller than, could be smaller than psi a, but not too much. And now you see the game I'm going to play. So let's call this neighborhood n. So this estimate is true for all omega, so I'm just going to focus on n. If it's true for omega, it's I can put n here. All right, now let's compare the two sides. What's the weight here? It's at least 2 sigma psi a minus epsilon delta square over 2. And what's the weight here? Right? This is at least that much and that is at most that much. And what happens? So if you take, this is a constant, you bring it, which one of these two is bigger? You're subtracting a smaller number here compared to that. So this is a bigger weight compared to that. So if you bring it on the other side, you get a negative weight there. Does that make sense what I'm saying here? If you divide two by this, then remember this is a constant. I remove the this part is still here. This is a constant. I bring it to the other side. It's a negative weight. And now you let sigma go to infinity. There's no sigma on this side, but this side goes to zero. So that is zero. And so this is zero over n. Okay? So you get u is zero on that neighborhood. So this is how cardinal estimates give you unique continuity. Notice how important it was the value of the weights on different parts. 
So I had the, I used the value, the psi was here, something, and the psi value here was bigger. This is really the story about Car using Cardinal estimates. The part where psi, where information is known, like this was here, you want to keep the psi values big. Your, your cardinal weight should be big on the part where data is given, and the part where data is unknown, you want to wear, your target one weight should be smaller. This so for a given pseudo differential operator, for a hyperbolic case, for example, there are many con many pseudo convex functions. The trouble when you want to apply it, the trick is to find the right pseudo convex function so that it is positive, it's large on the known things, and small on the unknown. You haven't told us what pseudo-convex is. Sorry? You haven't told us what pseudo-convex is. Exactly. So anyway, th I just want to show you one proof. So this part, the fact that controlling the value of the Kahneman weight from different parts, that's the game. You have to construct a Kahneman weight, Kahneman I keep calling, pseudo-convex weight, which has the desired behavior. Okay, that's the crucial part here. And you notice how important it was that the constant was in, that this was an estimate uniform in sigma. And I'm sorry, it's almost time. Okay, and so what's the pseudo convexity condition? That's a punchline. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I, okay, I haven't even told you the application, but Brandon, would you rather have me go faster? And so. Okay, so. Given this, you know, most of you know, since we all look so experts here, I'm just saying good. So here is PX. This is the symbol. The principal symbol for that is. Okay, that's the principal symbol. Associated to that, you have the bicharacteristics. Okay? Hyperbolic problems, rays, and bicharacteristics are crucial. So what is the bi so these are solutions of the system of ODEs. So associated with this that so-called related to the Hamilton Jacobi equation, all that stuff, right? And you have some initial conditions. X at S equal to zero is X zero, C at zero is some C C. Okay? So these are called the bi characteristics. They carry information for hyperbolic problems about singularities of solutions and so on. Okay. You're not interested, well, not the bi characteristics carry, you enter in what is called the non bi characteristic. So you're interested in things for which this is zero in the beginning. And since the value of PXC is preserved by characteristics, it will be that this will be zero also. So the null by characteristics are basically solutions of this ODE where the initial thing satisfies this. And it's the null by characteristics which are important for hyperbolic and energy trans carrying energy and stuff, not the general by characteristics. So it's null by characteristics. Okay, now this is a term in X, Z space. It's projection onto the X space of all rays. So here you have this term XS and CS. Just the XS part of it for the non bi characteristics of all rays. The pseudo convexity condition is in terms of the rays. What does it say? And it's very easy to describe. And this is the genius of, I mean, I, I, I still don't figure out how we're going to figure it all out. That this is, this inequality here looks like some sort of algebraic thing. And the proof for the second order operator case is actually purely an algebraic calculation, not even an integration for the second order case. It's all about trying to get a positive definite quadratic form. The funny, but the interesting thing is, I don't know how Hermann saw this, but this, to make something positive, he's figured out the condition, which is geometrical in nature. And that is the amazing part. I don't know how he, how he was led to it, but this is the amazing part. There's an a purely algebraic thing about trying to get something positive definite. And condition that he comes up with, 
for nothing to be positive definite is purely geometrical. Okay, what is the statement? So, so phi is C to convex with respect to PXD if the following holds. Okay, one is so it has to be hold at every point in the domain. Okay? But what so firstly of course the gradient of P has to be non-zero at every point. Otherwise it's not a manifold. Secondly, this is the condition. You draw the level surface. Okay? You draw the level surface. Here is the side P greater than PA. And here is the side P less than PA. So it says the following. P is pseudo-convex with respect to PXD if the following holds, basically at every point and for every level surface. It says, look at the ray for this operator. The rays for this operator are curved. So it will go some of them will just cross this thing, right? Okay. Some of them will be tangential. Some of the rays will be like that. The pseudo-convexity condition is the following. It says, I think I try to say this wrong. If there is a ray which is tangential at one point then this ray must have only first order contact. Here is a more precise way to say it. This is a ray, right? So this is some excess term. So look at phi of excess. Okay? So compute the derivative of this. So it says that if it is tangential at this point, okay, which means this is zero, then the second derivative must be positive. Which is like saying that this is a local minima. That means if there is a ray which is tangential to this level curve, then it must stay on the phi greater than phi a side. Every ray either crosses over if it is tangential, then it has to stay on the phi greater than phi a side. So this A is a null by characteristics. Right. The projection is a null by characteristics. So why is this imply? What? Let's think about it about unique continuation. So you know, if your u was zero here and phi, why would u be zero here? Because if u was non-zero at some point, the rays will carry information about it. Now either it's going to go this way or this way. If ray will carry information about it, it will cross over to the other side. Because the only way it cannot carry information on the other side is if it was tangential on this side and stayed there. And that's not allowed. So you can see why the geometrical pseudo-convexity condition suggests why unique continuation might be true. Because for hyperbolic and other things, energy is carried along rays by a high characteristic, not like so it makes sense. Okay, so you say, well, how do I verify this pseudo-convexity condition? The answer is actually you can because the rays are solutions of that, both of these conditions, that if this is zero, then this is positive, it's purely algebraic condition. You can write it down in terms of the symbol. It's very easy. I mean, if you look in Hortmarker's book, it's written there. Looking at it, you can't tell right away that he's really saying this, though he says that in the book. So to verify that something is pseudo-convex, you have to actually verify some algebraic condition. This is the way to think about it. So when you're trying to construct Kahneman weights, you have to find functions <laughs> p of x which satisfy a certain algebraic condition. And that is not always easy. OK? So anyway, I think I've already gone past the time. And thank you very much. The exponential, the, the weight it comes in the form exponential. I mean, what is it? Just uh, gives us the positivity or something? Or does it uh, I wish. So, no one has really given a clear explanation of why such a thing is useful for uniform, for uniqueness in the Cauchy problem. 
So it's there because it's there. <laughs> okay, no one has any explanation for why such an estimate. I mean, so I think only about the proof, by the way. Second order case, the proof is, is purely an al algebraic thing, and uh, it, it's just an algebraic uh, inequality. No integration involved. You try to do, you basically try to set up some things as the divergence of some expression plus a positive definite quadratic form. That's really what you're doing. The divergence of the expression gives you boundary terms, and the positive definite parts will give you the right, the left hand side. I haven't answered your question, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer as to what the exponential does. Okay. Besides the geometry of the operators, the regularity of the coefficients has no role uh, in the constant. Right, so basically, so how regular should the coefficients be? So you see, you, as you're doing your proof, especially for the second order case, it's an algebraic operation. So you see, well, what is the minimum regularity I need? I think you need H1 or something like that. So you basically need to do, I think, one integration by part or something on the principal order coefficients. So, so there is some analysis. Uh, no, there's, there's nothing more than that. That's, it's nothing more than integration by part. Okay, and one final thing is notice that the lower order terms play no role. So whatever is true for this is true for any first order perturbations. So if you're writing a pseudo convex function, you have to worry only about the principal parts. If the principal part is just a wave operator, doesn't matter what the first order of perturbation, right? It doesn't matter. Sorry, someone, no? Where, you never said where your x nulls are initiating. Are they from any non characteristic type of Sorry? Your x nulls condition, is it, are they where your rays initiating from any? It, it doesn't matter, right? So the, 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 the non characteristic is basically any solution of this which satisfies So these are any any ray, any. Look at all the family of rays. So if you have the wave equation, all 45 degree lines in XP space must satisfy. So the scheme must satisfy that in relation to that. So for the wave operator, actually, this is a one example of the pseudo convex wave. This is commonly used. You can prove that this is pseudo convex with respect to the wave operator. Okay, so many of the applications of the wave operator, this is the pseudo convex function used. Okay, sorry for taking so long, and I any hope I didn't bore anyone. But any more questions? So, uh, but the, at least this second order coefficient should be non gen non degenerate type. Well, non degenerate in what? Uh, maybe it should be a matrix. Yeah. It should be non singular or something. Okay. Let me think. I don't recall it. I'm just wondering that if it was singular at some point, meaning it's zero somewhere, or yeah, it has, like then what happens? Um, <coughs> I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, I think maybe you're right. Maybe. Operator, ultra hyperbolic, they are all fine. But Correct. But I understand what I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Right. One thing is, by the way, um, no, it include right. What happens is that if you have things which are not which are singular. This theory is not very good for you. For example, a parabolic operator. Yeah, yeah. Parabolic. Right. So the parabolic operator, the pseudo convex functions are, I think, only t equals constant. So you will not get anything interesting out of it. Because for parabolic operators, the delta t has to be part of the same order as the Laplacian, which does, this does not allow. So that's why this theory will not apply. And this is only for a single equation. The theory for systems is actually still not clear, I think. For Kahneman estimates for systems is still not. Right, so your question, right. So, so the parabolic operator, it applies to that, but you don't get anything interesting out of it. Any more questions? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for a given P, so what is the uh, is there any P is guaranteed? I mean the existence of uh Kahneman way yeah. the single convex function is guaranteed. Uh I so elliptic everything is if it's not then I think I haven't studied I'm sure you can always construct, you can probably prove it. That there is a probably or at least one. Uh 
because you know, I guess let's put it like this: you can do a change of variables, and uh, maybe from that, I think you can prove. I'm not certain; I, I don't know the answer. Oh, yeah, but you are saying, I mean, one can write the algebraic conditions with principal symbol. Correct. So looking at that, uh, it's not such a trivial thing to look at. True, but uh, <laughs> at least you have the knowledge of the principal symbol. Right. So you can. Then, uh, but so, but it still takes some effort because, as I said, constructing them is not trivial. If you look, once you look at the condition, you will see why why it's so bad. So, there is <coughs> this notion of p convexity. Yeah, I don't. Book, I, is, is it unique? I don't know actually. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, I've heard about it sixty years. And uh, did you think LP right? So, what about LP spaces? Uh, no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I, I, I mean, this is this is about my the limit of my. I mean, so as I said, I, I don't know about any LP things for these days. But I think uh, that uh, Nodes has something on LP calculus. Who? Um, Tatarus. Tatarus, okay. I see. I haven't. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is much more to this. I, I know a little bit more. I haven't told you about inverse problems. As I said, it's been proved for applied for two inverse problems. One is for the elliptic inverse problem. You know, the, where you have partial data. There, the trick is to find so-called limiting part in one way because you want phi and minus phi both to be things. And uh, where data is given, you want phi large. Where data is not known, you want phi value small. So you have to cook up something. So this, and the other one is the bogeen Plimano result from 81, which I'll tell some other time. So uh, you didn't have uh, phi, you mentioned this one. The phi and minus phi both has to be the... For, the, for that particular application. Okay. But then, uh, but here it's but it's a little more different. It's limiting part of one weight and they have something. So it's not this theory. It's something much more sophisticated. Actually, I don't even know what it, I mean, that theory is all. But it's much harder and much more uh, difficult. More questions, let's thank the speaker again. And I learned my t-shirt. <laughs> T-shirt is right here. This is the place. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. And, uh, before you go, uh, there are several people to thank, and we should thank them. So first of all, it's the speakers, and uh, uh, we all know who the speakers are, but I will list them: Vaninathan, Srikar, Rakesh, Hike, Yan, um, Slava, Peter, Tim, Cliff, Bastian. And uh, we should not forget the yourself, <laughs> <laughs> the non-academic staff, because they are processing your reimbursements. Jayashree, uh, Mahalakshmi, Parya, Joyce, who helped this setup. Uh, Peter Braskin, who helped you with the accommodation. Um, the administrative officers, Kannan, and there's one more Kannan, who is uh, managing your reimbursements. Uh, the housekeeping staff. Puzzle and uh, Srikant, the sysadmins. So if there is one non-academic staff who put through all the lectures, it is Puzzle. Right. <laughs> so the housekeeping staff, the security, catering, they, I think they provided great food. Um, Dean Gauda, the former Dean, Mighty Ramaswamy. So Dean Gauda is not here, but uh, former Dean, Mighty Ramaswamy. And uh, our funding agencies, ICTS, TIFR CAM, EADS Foundation, National Center for Mathematics, who is, by the way, giving your air tickets, um, and Professor Pani from NPDE, who is providing Rakesh's air tickets. <laughs> okay, before we go away, there's one person we really need to thank, because we did it all the work. We were, I mean, one and a half and a half, I hope you don't mind me saying so. Perfectly right. <laughs> One person did the work, and let's let let Venki stand up and we should all thank him. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.